a little bit of background. I was a 20-year-old female at the time. I moved in with my uncle in San Antonio, Texas with the agreement that I didn't have to pay rent as long as I helped him out with chores and my cousins. I got a job at a super-known coffee chain downtown close to the touristy part of the area. We had a lot of regulars and a lot of homeless coming in and out. I felt relatively safe though because I got to know the people there and it was almost always a lot of foot traffic. I used to even take walks after work in the area, especially since I was super close to the river walk. Skipped to a couple months into the job and I was friends with everyone I worked with. We were all super close. On this particular day, it was one of my co-workers last day. There were about three guys who had been there almost all morning. They hadn't bought anything and were just hanging out which was not unusual for my location. On my break I decided to walk down to a nearby drugstore so I can get a farewell card and maybe a small gift for said co-worker. I walked out and put my earphones in and before I could press play I heard the door open behind me and footsteps following behind. Whoever it was caught up to me and started walking beside me matching my pace exactly. I turned to look and it was one of the guys that had been there all morning. He was a bit taller than me and reminded me a lot of Lakey Stanfield. He tried to ask for my number and I kindly told him no. He persisted and I with a short temper told him to F off. He stopped and stared at me in surprise as I don't look like someone who speaks up or it would be rude. He stood there as I walked away and by the time I went back they were gone, I proceeded to tell my co-workers about the encounter and we laughed it off. I thought that would be the end of it. I was wrong. Every shift after that he would already be there just hanging out or would walk in mid-shift. Sometimes with somebody else and sometimes by himself. I assumed he was just another homeless person because how else was he always able to be around? My shifts were sporadic. Some days I opened some days I closed some days I worked mid but it didn't matter he was always there. At that point I started feeling paranoid. I would always catch him staring in my direction. He never ordered anything, never talked to me, and luckily wouldn't follow me. He would just sit there, watching me. I started mentioning it to my coworkers, and they started noticing it too. One of my team leaders would help me out by sending me to wash dishes in the back or organize the cooler. My co-workers would also try and place themselves to try and block me from his view. I started feeling uncomfortable at work. Sometimes when I closed a co-worker would walk me to my car before heading home themselves. Or if I didn't close they would walk me to my car and turn around and head back to work. Then one day when he was just staring, I was working the register that day. He walked up and ordered water. I asked for his name for his order. I now had his first name just in case. He took his water and sat down. I had mentioned him before to my manager but because he hadn't really done anything we couldn't do anything besides noted in the manager book. The next day I worked with my manager. It was him, two other co-workers, and me. I told them I had to go to the bathroom real quick. There were two bathrooms right next to each other but sort of hidden from the coffee bar and register and they weren't gender specific. I walked around the bar to the lobby area, I had to pass his table and walk down the lobby to get to the bathrooms. I noticed him get up before going inside the bathroom. I sat down to do my business when someone rattled the knob. I shouted out that it was occupied but whoever it was kept rattling the door until I finished. When I opened the door no one was there and walking back I noticed him adjusting back into his chair. I was super freaked out and told my boss. He couldn't tell him anything because we had no proof that it was him. Later that shift he got up and picked up a coffee from the pickup area. My boss assumed he had ordered it and let him take it. I told him it wasn't and that it wasn't even his name. My boss used this as an opportunity to tell him if he does something like that again he can't come back. The man apologized and actually stuck to the rules every day after that. He went back to just watching me. Cut to Valentine's Day. One of my team leaders and I would be scheduled to work certain Thursdays after close to deep cleaning the store. We would stay until 1 a.m. This was one of those Thursdays. We were almost done and I had to clean the bathrooms as one of the last chores. I finished and as I walked out of the bathroom I saw him peeking in with both his hands pressed to the window eyes wide just staring at me with this super intense look. I froze for a second just staring back. I noticed on one of his palms that is pressed to the window, a purple foam heart. He doesn't move at all. I freak out and Steve goes back into the bathroom. I shout, Hannah. Hannah. He's here. He's back. She barely hears me through the music we were blasting. Hannah was the team lead who would help hide me from him so she knew the huge fear I had towards him. She walks towards the bathroom shouting back, what are you saying? What's going on? As soon as she gets close she sees him. I told her again, he's here, 
he's watching me, she started shouting through the window, you need to leave. If you don't leave we're calling the police, I step out a little to see if he'll leave and he's ignoring her and his eyes are fixated in my direction. I step back into the bathroom and my lead continues to shout at him to leave and threatens him with the police. About five minute pass and he realizes that I'm not stepping out until he leaves so he does. The next day I was my lead and I told my manager I wanted to file a police report. He told me not to wait until he talked to his boss. He showed up again that day but I was only there to talk to my manager and leave right after. When I got home a friend convinced me to call the cops. So I text my boss that I don't care what he or his boss says. I'm scared and I'm gonna file that report. I dial 911 and tell them a summarized version they tell me they're going to send someone to where I live to take the official report. The two officers were so nice and supportive. I told them my whole story and how my boss didn't feel the need to get cops involved since I wasn't harmed. The officers told me that I should have called right away and defended me saying they could get him for harassment. I thank them and they tell me that if he shows up to dial 911 so they can take him in for trespassing and harassing. I think that day my manager banned him and warned him because he never showed up to the coffee shop again. A few months later when I was comfortable again with downtown I went out with some friends to walk around. We were close to where I worked and as we rounded a corner I saw him and so I ducked into a little corner store and my friends followed. I told them I saw him and they kept an eye out. Once he was out of view we left the store and that was the last time I saw him. So creepy coffee shop stalker, let's not meet again. I've never really shared this experience with anyone except my mom, a few close friends and my boyfriend, but I don't think that they really realize how much this still impacts me. I recently discovered this subreddit so I'm hoping sharing my experience will lift a weight, if you will. I worked a fairly entry-level office job in a mixed commercial-slash-industrial area in my community. Because of the nature of most of the work in the area, mostly manufacturing and construction-type jobs, it wasn't uncommon to see people walking around with canvas pants, covered in oil, and being a little dingy-looking. I carpooled with my mom since she worked nearby, and that particular day my mom had called me to tell me she was going to be about a half-hour late picking me up. Instead of waiting at my work for her, I decided that I would walk to the coffee shop nearby and wait there for her. It was late in the afternoon, around 4 p.m., so it was very quiet. I was the only customer in the shop when I sat down at a table to read a newspaper. A few minutes after I sat down, a very handsome middle-aged guy walked in a few minutes behind me. He was very attractive and had a very comfortable charm to him, but it really struck me how clean he looked for the area, especially wearing overalls and work boots. Didn't think too much of it at first honestly, so when he asked me if he could sit with me and chat while he waited for his own drive, I said okay. We actually had a nice conversation for a little while, until he started asking personal questions about me. They were not very specific questions, but in hindsight it seems really weird to me. At the time though, perhaps it was naive, I just kept talking even though I started getting a really strange vibe. I started to get really uncomfortable when I asked him what he did for a living. He told me he worked at a nearby manufacturing place, and that he had been working there for about a year. He then told me it was the first job he ever had so he was really excited about continuing his career there. Remember, this guy is middle-aged. Not only what he said, but how he said it, struck me as so strange. This became my first bold and waving real red flag to GTFO. I instantly had a moment where I was like, wait a sec, what middle-aged man is only one year into his first job? especially in an area that can't really be shrugged off as prolonged education, rich parents, etc. To me, that screamed a recent prison release. On top of that, for him to be so clean despite him saying where he worked, nothing was adding up. I immediately started texting my mom under the table and said that I was really uncomfortable and she needed to come ASAP. I continued talking to him like nothing was weird, but deep down I was really regretting telling him anything about myself in case he followed me. So when my mom pulled into the parking lot I quickly jumped out of there and hopped in the car. As she pulled out of the parking lot, I see him leave the coffee shop and hop into his own car. Now, remember in our conversation he had told me he was waiting for a drive if I had been paying attention to him as he came and I would have realized that it was a lie and he drove there himself and would have avoided the whole situation. Obviously I'm really freaking out. I quickly explained to my mom what was going on and she sped off down the street. Look behind us, who was there? guy in his car. She purposely ducked and dove down all sorts of bizarre streets and went in circle after circle. 
he followed us for close to 30 minutes before giving up. I don't know why I didn't report my experience to the police. I just was so shocked that something like that would happen. Went on with my life and shook it off as if nothing had happened. Fast forward about a week and my mom picks up a newspaper only to find that on the front page there is a picture of this one insane very handsome man. He had kidnapped a woman and shoved her into the trunk of her own car, drove her, while she was in the trunk, about 200 miles to another city, forced her to take all her money out of her bank account and then abandoned her there with no wallet and no vehicle. If not for my mom, I could have been so screwed. Fortunately the woman was not physically injured or sexually assaulted, but I cannot imagine spending hours in the trunk of your own car not knowing what someone was going to do to you. It's been about seven years since this happened and I still have some serious trust issues with strangers. I didn't work in that area much longer, it became too difficult for me. While I did work there, I had previously gone to that particular coffee shop daily during my lunch breaks, and still, to this day I have never been back there. First off, I just want to state that I changed names in this story and omitted them entirely when necessary. This happened this morning at about 10 a.m. The backstory. Working full-time as a full-time student leaves me with very little time for me under normal circumstances. Classes just ended not long ago and lots of folks have left my university town to go back home for the holidays. I work in a coffee shop so people going back home means that not only am I catching a break from school right now, but work is usually super slow as well and this has been beyond beneficial for my mental state. The story. I usually reserve the use of marijuana for times when my UC is flaring or to gain back appetite lost for the same reason, but as I somehow ended up working 9 to 5 Monday through Friday this week with the entire weekend off, a nice treat to get two off in a row, and me recovering from a mild hangover from last night, I figured I could probably smoke before lunch, play some bidya, and be useful by the time lunch needs to be made. I roll one, slide the balcony door over, and smoke. This is fine. I tell myself. I deserve this after a long week, some time to myself. I have nothing to do today so I'm sure being high in the middle of the day won't be an issue. I don't have to see anyone today. After patting myself on the back for a few minutes more than needed, I slide the door shut and huddle up in a blanket on the couch. I was the only one awake in my apartment this morning, and I could hear someone in the hallway. All of a sudden there are three hurried knocks at my door, and I bolt up. Oh freak did I forget someone was coming to meet me I think as I looked through the peephole to see a middle-aged man with Homer Simpson hair, transition lenses, and a handful of gold-colored wrapped presents. He's also freaking around on his phone when I look out, and I see the unit directly across the hall is getting dominoes and the driver is standing in their doorway. Not feeling uneasy considering the audience, I open the door. This man greets me and starts to walk in. I stand firm in the doorway and once he realizes I'm not moving and he's trying to slide past between myself and a lamp which he nearly knocks over, he sticks his hand out. I'm Terry, so I shake his hand back firm while staring him in the eye still confused. Keep in mind that though I was trying to look tough, I'm a fair-skinned blonde man with cracked lips, and my pajamas and eyes are definitely red and glossy. I'm her father, he tells me. I thought I remembered our roommate mentioning that her father is a tall black man and this gentleman was not only white but probably standing at about five foot solid. Oh you're Linda's father, important that I spoke her name? Let me go let her know you're here, hold on, and I make my way down the hallway to knock on her bedroom door, next to my fiancé in a shared room. I go and knock and say there's a visitor for her, and by the time I knock he is right behind me, still freaking about with his phone while holding those presents in his hands. Now I have to do the crappy awkward slide by him in my own apartment. I figured I'd leave them be, he seemed beyond excited to be here to visit his daughter so I made my way back to the living room. Before I can even lay down again, I hear, no, I'm Jane's father, from down the hall. This mother freaker isn't here for my roommate, he's either lost or actively trying to see our apartment, for some reason. I bolt right up and make my way down the hallway, half tripping over things since I'm sitting at about an 8 at this point. As I see him going for the doorknob to my bedroom where my sleeping fiancé lie, I got a little loud, usually not in my character however I'm high on my last day off and there's a stranger possessing far too many red flags about to walk in on the love of my life, and told him that he's in the wrong unit. As I tell him this he must have been dialing on his phone while talking to my roommate because he pulls his phone to his face and goes, I'm here baby, and tries to ignore me. I repeated myself a little louder. 
and he asked where he was. Unit 14, I'll show you the door, and the pizza guy is still there in the doorway when I send him out, Terry asking his phone which floor she's on. That's when I realized this entire thing happened in about two minutes and the pizza guy and I shared a look of solidarity as I locked my door. My roommate came out and we chatted about how freaking weird that is. She laughed since I somehow handled it well from the orbit only medicinal grade marijuana can send you to, and I logged into PlayStation to let the story out to one of my mates over a few matches of Overwatch. Here's where it gets interesting. So around 2pm my fiancé woke up, we both had a long night. I only wound up having a drink or two thanks to my UC and IBS limiting me from going all out but she went back wild before bed and was nursing a bad hangover. I was sober by this point and mostly over the whole ordeal, having had a nap since then and it almost felt like it was a dream. I mention offhand that a man came by, and she says it kind of woke her up, she remembers hearing someone familiar in the apartment. I explain the whole story, and she asks me what he looked like. This could be purely coincidental. But I guess about a month ago while I was at work and she was between classes a man fitting the description right down to the transition lenses came beating on the door asking to open up. Unfortunately I forget exactly the details of that encounter and she's sleeping next to me now so I can't ask, but he seems to keep thinking our unit is someone else's, or he's just trying to get a viewing of our fully furnished unit without the tour guide. Leaves a bad taste in my mouth now thinking about it. First time poster. Not too sure how to sign off, but thanks for taking the time to read this. Mostly just wanted it off of my chest, but Terry, let's not meet again, or you might be getting a better view of our apartment than you'd like. I've been needing to express myself about what happened between October 2017 to February 2019, so for some backstory to try to answer some questions before they get asked. I graduated from school in 2016. I wasn't working at this time. It wasn't like I didn't try to find work. I did, I just didn't get many calls back. I had a couple of job interviews but they all fell flat. And it didn't help that I stupidly refused to put my resume forward to the local supermarkets because most of the high school bullies work at which the thought of working with the group of people who terrorized me for four-ish years filled me with too much anxiety. So instead I spent most of the time surrounded with the select few friends that I had which in the end wasn't that many at all. I was always sort of the quiet one at high school and early on into school I got a girlfriend. I spent most of my time developing our relationship further instead of finding friends. A mistake I would have come to regret when we split up right before high school ended. I didn't really have many friends to fall back on. I had one really close friend all throughout high school that we will call Sam as I don't want to use any real names. Sam was really supportive when my and my girlfriend broke up. He also had a great job, a really nice family money, friends, and at the time was a pretty good influence on me as my parents would say. He didn't do any drugs or drink. I looked up to him as a person and as my best friend. So it was a really easy decision when Sam asked me to move in with him when he found a cheap rental property. Sam's family were friends with the small real estate agent's office so it was easy for Sam to find a house, even if it was stupidly overpriced for the condition of the house. We were stupid and our parents just wanted us out. Sam's family believed he was too successful for them to need to support, and my parents, stepdad, wanted me out because he was tired of needed to support me, again I wasn't working. Sam and I moved out with this childhood friend who we will call, Blake, now before we moved I had never met this person before he was never really home because he was always out for work or dirt bike riding. He lived with us for about 4 months before the first big terrible event happened. Sam let two strangers, from Blake's perspective sleep in his bed when he was away from home. Blake got home one night at 2.30 a.m. ready for bed to walk into his room to see two teenagers having sex in his bed. He left the next day and as far as I know to this day after their last augment they never talked to each other again. So after that brief introduction this is where I will get into the bulk of this post starting from February 2018. At this point I had a source of income. I had gotten a job though my dad and I were enjoying being out of the house. By this time I was starting to suspect that something was wrong with Sam. He wasn't leaving to go to work before me which was weird. He was increasingly snappy and angry all the time and he was leaving work early all the time and didn't tell me where he was going. In the end he was cheating on his girlfriend at the time with a girl from our high school. The first few months with my friend acting this way he would threaten to move all of my stuff out of the house and onto the road if I didn't do something he said. Like cleaning up the house on my own, going shopping or any other various tasks. I didn't have much, only my mattress, 
he accidentally broke my bed frame while I was at work in my office computer which I used for Discord and playing small indie games so it wouldn't have been hard for him to actually do it. He never did but I guess it was because I never really argued with him. He started stealing my clothes which didn't even fit him and would let me borrow his shirts to brag about how good of a friend he was. Eventually he just stopped cooking food for himself, Sam's dad had given him a fuel card to use for petrol. He used to buy fast food twice a day for months. Until his dad cut him off from the card in which he turned to 2L bottles of iced coffee in McDonald's nightly. I understand that this was more of his business and not mine, but he eventually asked me to cover his part of the rent and he couldn't afford bills which made it my issue. He asked me to buy him food and when I refused he would guilt trip me into feeling like absolute crap or he would block the entrance to the house or my doorway to my room. I was already really anxious since he had started getting more aggressive and angry so I often agreed which left me struggling with money. At some stage he just stopped going to work, as he explained it. Work let me leave early today and they said they would call me in again if they needed me. We got into an argument. I told him that he was wrong and he still had to go to work. It took him 10 weeks to call up his work who explained to him what they meant for that day, and that they had registered him as abandoning his job, so he ended up unemployed. I tried to support him as much as he had for me during my breakup and when I moved in when I was unemployed but he got really mad and angry all the time, which he took out on me, screaming at me for being right. Because of all this free time he started inviting the girl from high school over all the time, threatening me to keep it a secret from his girlfriend. Obviously in the end I didn't since I was close with Sam's current girlfriend. I was actively trying to stay out of the house so I only ever saw this girl over two or three times, but in reality she was over all the time when I was at work. About four times a day, or the more tragic part of when I was living with him. He decided to buy some pets. He was given a bird from his family. He brought a dog which he called Sparta and he decided to buy a cat which he called Skittles for the girl from high school, which ran away. He brought another cat and called it Skittles again. And the state that this kitten was left in was appalling when either the girl or I wasn't around the house. It was revealed that he would lock the kitten in a closet and only feed her when he remembered. I should have tried harder to protect the animals in the house. I tried my best to feed them when Sam wasn't around but when he caught food missing he would question me. When he found me feeding his cat he grabbed me, slammed me into the wall and screamed at me for poisoning his animals. I remember he hit me. Really hard. One day I came home and the bird that he kept near the door wasn't there and Sam wasn't home. I asked him where the bird was and apparently it had fallen over in its cage and broke its neck. This was where immediate panic started and I realized that I was living with someone who was much more than depressed. Sam came home later and I was ready to explode at him. I was fueled with rage and anger for what he had done to the bird with an empty shoebox he proceeded to go to our backyard. I followed him and then it turns out that he had the box to bury the kitten who according to Sam, broke its neck jumping around in the closet, I remember the way he told me vividly. He wasn't sad or angry. He was empty. His eyes felt hollow and he told me he wasn't sad about it. He went back inside to his room and locked himself in there. I didn't see him for nearly a week. I came home one day from a very tiring day from work. I had requested to get the morning off to clean for a house inspection. At this point I believed that this was our second one so I stayed behind at work to do some overtime. Sam thought I was out for the night and when I got home around 8.30 I found him and the girl from high school smoking weed in our lounge room. I didn't say a word. I couldn't. At this point Sam wasn't the same person I went to high school with. Every day over the past six months he had found a way to yell, steal, guilt, punch, kick, threatened me nearly every day there was always a reason he ate at me. Blamed me for what happened to the bird slash cat because I wasn't there to stop them from hurting themselves. This was one of the final turning points for me. I went to bed and had a sleepless night. I heard Sam insult me, I heard him cheat on his girlfriend, I heard him lie about money, being employed and using everything he remembered from high school to impress her. The next day, I told his girlfriend, I stole his dog who was incredibly malnourished, even after I had been sneakily feeding him a handful of dry food twice a day, and beaten. I called the RSPCA and reported him for animal abuse, I emailed photos I took of the house for proof. I used the cover of the real estate agent coming over for an inspection to protect myself from him overreacting. When I came back to collect the last of my things, which was my old PC, I stupidly entered the house thinking our real estate agent was in there. I thought the car was there when it wasn't. I was greeted in the hallway by a shirtless Sam who pushed me against the wall. 
he smelled of weed and alcohol was burning into my skin. He pushed me up against the wall with one hand and showed me a knife in the other hand. He had me pinned against the wall with a knife in his hand. There was a long augment which was him screaming at me and me shaking and not being able to spit my words out. He got angry when I told him where Sparta was so he choked me and ran the silver of the knife down my arm. I remember feeling like I blacked out, everything was a blur. He kept getting more and more intense going on about how I betrayed him as a friend and his girlfriend dumped me over him. He let go of my neck and pushed me harder into the wall with his shoulder, and drew the knife close to my neck. I truly felt like I was going to die, I muttered out, my friends can hear you, we were close enough to my room and he often knows when I left my room I always had discord open. He let go of me and I ran away to my car and left. I stayed with my parents for a couple of days living on their couch, too afraid to really talk to anyone. My parents called me jumpy and I told them that I missed them because I had hardly seen them over the past 10 or so months. Sam chucked me a message saying we need to talk, which we did in a public place. He told me that he was moving out back to his parents because he could no longer support himself and the house had too many bad memories for him. He left. To this day I still have not seen him. This was around August 2018 people from high school stopped being his friends once the girl and I told all of our collective friends what he did and how he acted. I reported him to the police. I never pressed charges but I told them I never wanted to see Sam again. I don't think anything ever came out of it. I couldn't afford to get a restraining order as I recall being told they cost money but it is reported. I moved back into the house on my own. He left all of his furniture and bedding as it was, only taking his headphones, his PS4 and his TV. From that moment on I was alone and living in the house that my best friend nearly killed me in. Sleeping on his couch in the living room because I couldn't afford my own. I was alone and I was in a really bad head space. I stopped talking to all of my friends and at work and I started having nightmares. So this was dating from October 2017 to August 2018 I was still in the house until early 2019 which living in the aftermath of what Sam did to me was as bad if not worse than living without him. The isolation and darkness and things I saw and regret not doing, like not being there to save the bird and the cat, still eat away at me. I will need to do some digging but I will try to find images of the house and the dog for proof if needed and post an imager album. Things didn't get better, and then worse until I met a girl. I have been writing this for about three hours and I am more than happy to write up the other part of this story which I will be likely doing in confessions or here once I feel more up for it. Talking about this has been really hard. So where am I now? At the end of 2019 I met my current partner. She is absolutely incredible and we actually bought a house together last month. We currently live with my parents until we move in in two weeks and I think all of my negative feelings about my old house and Sam have resurfaced due to me moving again. In the end I'm still scared and cautious but getting this off my chest is a way that I'm moving forward and putting my old house behind me. This happened four years ago. I'm a girl and at the time this happened, I was 12 going on 13 in just a month or two. The friend I mentioned in this story was 14 at the time. The friend, Sally, who I was staying with that night was quite a bit older than me. At least at the time the two-year age gap was quite big. At 12 to 13 years old I was about to start my second year of middle school, whereas Sally should have been about to begin her sophomore year of high school. I met her in the beginning of my first year at a new school. She was older than the other kids in our grade and was considered one of the popular kids, and I think that was what drew me to her at first. We became fast friends and before we knew it, were spending every single weekend together. Seriously. Every. Single. Weekend. Nothing seemed to be out of the ordinary. It was your typical Friday night. We carpooled to her family's apartment after school. I've always been a picky eater, so when her family had dinner I didn't eat with them. I just snacked on the pop tart that I'd stowed away in my backpack in case they ordered something that I wouldn't eat. Something to note is that her family was pretty religious. I wouldn't go as far as to say they were fanatics, but they didn't allow their kids to watch horror movies or anything that was rated PG-13 or older. It didn't steam from the desire to protect them from something inappropriate. Sally's mother had an irrational fear that scary movies had satanic messages. We asked to watch The Perch, and her mom obviously said no. After some negotiating, she agreed to let us watch Hunger Games instead. After the movie, Sally and I went to hang out in her room. She put on some music and being the age we were, we gave each other makeovers. By the end of it we were looking much older than just 12 and 14. 
this part of the night is when things started to seem off to me. Sally wasn't the most positive influence. Despite being my best friend at the time, she was manipulative and got off on putting me down. She had a habit of talking to men online and lying about her age. Sally showed me some texts between her and the man she was talking to. I can't give you an exact recount of them, but they consisted of him trying to convince her to meet up with him and just the usual things you'd expect from a creep online. According to him, he was 19, tall, and blonde with soulful blue eyes. Once I saw the texts, I asked if she had a picture of him. Something didn't sit right with me after seeing the messages. She showed me what he looked like, and he was very clearly not 19. This man was at least 40 and looked like he lived in his mother's basement. Then we got a call from him. Sally answered without hesitation, and when I heard the voice on the other end of the call, I felt like I was going to be sick. You're so pretty, why don't you come meet me? He asked. Sally said that she couldn't because she was spending the night with a friend. The mention of that sparked his interest, and then he proceeded to try and ask us both to meet him. Sally, lacking any common sense, said yes. Thus began her plan for us to sneak out and walk 15 blocks to meet him in a deserted McDonald's parking lot. I didn't want to go. I was raised on stories of what happens to teen girls who meet random men from the internet in person. But after Adam and pleading from Sally that she didn't feel safe going by herself, I agreed. We took our phones with us for the walk. I had a kitchen knife stuffed in my bra in case something were to happen and I needed to defend myself. The route we had to take to get there didn't have very many street lamps and there weren't any houses. We were surrounded by trees on both sides of us. When we got to the parking lot, the only car parked nearby was a black beat-up 2000 Toyota Corolla. The car was still running when we got there, and from what we could tell there was more than one person inside. The man from the picture got out of the front passenger seat and left the door open behind him before approaching us. I turned my flash on so I could see, and he was obviously on something. I can't tell you what kind of drug it was for the life of me but his eyes were so wide they looked like they were about to pop out of his head. He was jittery and kept twitching. I became very conscious of how big he was. Maybe 6 feet 2 inches, around 280 pounds. For reference, my friend and I did not look our ages, even without makeup. I'm about 5 feet 2 inches. My friend was pretty tall, probably around 5 foot 6 inch dash 5 7. We were both significantly smaller than him. The man reached out for us and caught my friend by the arm. I went to get my knife as quickly as I could, and that's when I saw his friends getting out of the car. He invited us back to his car and offered us booze and drugs, but after seeing my knife and that I was ready to call the police he released my friend. I took Sally's arm and ran faster than I ever had in my entire life. We took the long way home to avoid them finding out where she lived in case they were following us. Once we got there, her family was still sound asleep. We locked all the doors, closed the blinds, and blocked him on everything. There wouldn't be any sleep that night, we were constantly peeking out the window, and to our dismay, that same Toyota was circling around her apartment building. Not once, not twice, but three times. I never mentioned any of this to my parents out of fear of getting grounded or in trouble. I'm 16 now and they still have no clue. I still get nervous when I see a car similar to the one from that night. As for Sally, her parents never found out either. We agreed to never speak about it again. Thankfully she moved into a new house just a few weeks after that happened. Safe to say Sally and I haven't spoken in three years. She was pissed at me for ruining her night and our friendship didn't last for long after that. We had a pretty bad falling out, but looking back on it now it was definitely for the better. So to Sally, thank you for teaching me a very valuable lesson and making me realize that some people are best just left alone. And to the man and his friends who tried to prey upon two young girls, let's not ever freaking meet again. So I was about 13 to 14 when this happened. I had been in a really dark place mentally and I met this guy through Tumblr. He told me his name was John and he thought I was really pretty and ran a cool Tumblr. He used pictures of this super generic emo guy and my tween heart was hooked. We talked for days and nights, and at one point I told him the town I lived in. Because my parents worked late I'd get home from school and usually be by myself at home, and I'd sit in the living room which had this big window facing the street. If you looked and you could see people and the TV and stuff, and I always kept the curtains open for light. So about two weeks after John and I were talking I'd noticed this white sedan drive slowly past my house at least once a day, usually right after I got home from school. I also noticed that whenever I was watching something and texting John, 
he'd find a way to bring the show into the conversation. I didn't think much of it at first because usually, it was shows I'd reblogged on my page before. That was until I started watching Pretty Little Liars on ABC Family. I hadn't posted or reblogged anything about the show, and then John started bringing it up, and I thought it was really weird. When I asked him about it he said I just seemed like the type of girl who watched it, so I dropped the issue. Fast forward two weeks and I'm with some friends at a nearby park. I wasn't having a good day so we decided to hang out and do photo shoots or whatever. So we're walking around and I turn my head and boom, there's that white sedan. Except it's closer and I can see the person in it. It's this older guy, maybe in his 20s, just watching us. I got really uncomfortable but didn't bring it up and then my friend suggested we go to the playground, which is right next to the parking lot. But at this point, none of my friends knew about this issue and I wanted to seem cool so I went along with it. We dicked around on the playground for a bit when I noticed the guy in the white sedan get out of his car and walk towards us. My middle school brain is trying to rationalize that this can't be the same sedan that kept sitting outside and driving past my house, and maybe the guy was just watching his kid or something. I wish that were the case. I went over to the water fountain to grab a drink and the guy comes up to me. Guy, hi there. Me, uh, hi. Guy, you're, my Tumblr handle, right? My blood went ice cold. Me, um, yeah, who are you? He smiled at me, this really wide grin. Guy, I'm John. I came to see you in person. You told me the town you lived in and how you wish we could meet. Me, listen I gotta get back to my friends. Guy, no no no, why don't we take a drive? We can go to McDonald's. He grabbed my arm at this point and I think one of my friends had noticed because she came up to us and the John guy released me and started to back up. Friend, hey, Lizzie, mom said we gotta head home. Dad's home and he had a long day. I nodded along and walked away with her, my whole group of friends crowding me as we headed back to my house. I never told my parents what happened that day, and none of my friends did either. None of us wanted our tumblers exposed and we thought we'd get in trouble for what happened, even though I was the only one at risk. When we got home I blocked John and reported the account, thanking my friends for saving me. It's scary to think what could have happened if they hadn't been there, and I don't think the story would have a happy ending. So when I was 13, my parents sent me to an all-girls fitness camp to work on becoming the best version of me. Well, let's be honest here, it was a fat camp. And it was as horrible as you can imagine. Bad food, all-day exercise, and god-awful counselors. The camp took place on a college campus, where they had a sleeping in dorms of two girls per room. But I had high hopes that it wouldn't be a complete waste of a summer as my roommate seemed like a great girl. Let's call her Mary. We had similar interests and the same style. It seemed like a perfect match. We would chat late into the night planning our escape from the camp, bemoaning having to give up our cell phones, though secretly I had managed to sneak mine in, and talking about our families and how much they sucked for sending us here. To be honest I was surprised that she was even at this camp. She was actually pretty fit, and her parents had signed her up for the whole summer versus mine only sending me for two weeks. Only two days into being at this place, I was pulled aside by another girl who I had become close friends with. She warned me that Mary had a lot of issues and the reason why she had been sleeping alone for X amount of time was because no one else wanted to room with her. Well, I brushed it off, thinking it was just rumors and other girls being mean. That day at lunch, Mary seemed rather mad at me and for the life of me I couldn't figure out why. So when I got a chance I asked her what was up. She ranted at me about how everyone was so mean and was I going to leave too. She went on to explain how this one girl she was rooming with switched rooms because she made friends with this popular girl and that she made up lies to be popular. And, silly me, I believed her. We continued hanging out and only now do I realize how she was keeping me from hanging out with anyone else. Near the end of my first week, the camp took us on a long walk over to the local pool. It was a big deal as it was super hot and only a once a week activity. Mary and I were super excited to go. When we got there we quickly claimed some chairs and left our stuff there. As Mary had been at the camp for several months she didn't have to pass some stupid, can you swim, test, that I assume is mandatory in most camp settings, so we were separated for about 20 minutes. After I passed with flying colors, thank you swim team, I jumped into the pool and just started floating around. I heard her calling my name, and saw her waving me over to the deep end of the pool. I swam over and asked her what was up, and she said she wanted to show me something. Next thing I know, 
Her hands are around my neck and she is shoving me underwater. Now, I am a good swimmer and I am very capable of holding my breath for quite a long time. But never in my life had anything like this happened to me and I panicked and opened my mouth to scream. Luckily before my mind had even processed what was happening, I had kicked up my legs and shoved her back and made a desperate escape. Somehow I managed to swim away and pull myself out of the pool. As I caught my breath and began to process what had just happened, I looked back at her. She was just staring at me, not having moved. I quickly grabbed my stuff and ran into the bathroom and called my mom. I was in tears as I explained what happened and it was very obvious she didn't believe me. I stayed in that bathroom until we left to go back to the camp. I didn't leave the counselor's sides the entire walk back. When we arrived back at the camp, I was pulled aside by one of the women in charge. She very rudely demanded I give her my cell phone. I of course denied having one and asked why she thought I did. She told me that my parents had called about some assault that had happened to me and they told them I had called. Quickly I excused it saying I borrowed a phone from a lady at the pool. Thankfully they bought that. They told me that I would be moved to a new room the next day, and that I had to spend the night with Mary one last time. Furiously I begged them to please let me sleep on the floor of another girl's room, but they insisted I was being melodramatic. As soon as I was left alone, again I raced to the closest bathroom and called my mom. That's when I learned the truth about Mary. I wasn't her second roommate, nor her third, fourth, or fifth. I was the sixth girl to stay in a room with her. Three of her roommates had left camp early and the other two had switched rooms at the first opportunity. All five other girls had made allegations of violence from Mary against them, but the camp refused to do anything, and insisted she was just a troubled girl who wanted to make friends. Or as they told my parents well she has had some issues in the past. That night I didn't sleep at all and neither did Mary. She sat up in bed staring at me all damn night. I could feel her watching me and I was terrified. I had my phone clutched in my hand with 911 dialed and ready to call at any moment. I practically cried when the sun came up. That day I was moved to a new room, in a different building, and somehow managed to break my foot in the process so my parents drove up and took me home with a cast on my foot to commemorate my time there. To this day I have had issues from what this girl did to me and I have never been able to live with roommates or make friends as easily. So Mary, wherever you are out there, let's never meet again. I recently made a post and just remembered a fun encounter that might serve as a warning to those working late at night. I was 24 at the time, working in a nightclub about a 10-minute walk from my home. I used to close on Tuesday nights slightly earlier than most nights as it was generally our slowest night of the week, closing around 12 a.m. instead of keeping customers until 2.30 a.m. Usually I'd be the only one left as I'd start cutting staff as the night went on and since it was a slower day of the week we didn't have security on. About two months in of regularly closing at 12 a.m., I was walking home. I used to bring in bulkier clothes to hide my figure when leaving alone as I've been followed slash chased home multiple times before and we'd often get men waiting after hours for us girls to come out knowing we'd eventually come out after closing and didn't want to attract attention to myself. I also used to walk home as I didn't have a car and had a few terrifying experiences with Uber drivers not actually driving me home turning out to be fake cabs slash Uber drivers or harassing me until I pretended to show interest or give them some way of contacting me to which Uber would just give me a $5 coupon for the trouble, but that's a story for another time. The bar was located along a main road that was home to the majority of the other bars and restaurants in the city downtown. Often at this time I'd maybe see a handful of people but the streets were generally empty. I'm walking and notice a parked car about a block away. The driver noticed me and you turns to be on the same side of the street as me. Now he's catcalling me and trying to get me to come into his car. I don't engage and keep walking. We're maybe a block or two past the initial spot I saw him and he's been slowly driving alongside the sidewalk. I'd cross the street but didn't want to get near his car. He keeps this up until about the halfway mark when he takes off in his car and I'm just relieved he's gone. CK. Guess who comes blasting back down the road? He does. Now my walk has turned into a light jog which then turns into me full on running. I'm running behind closed bars and businesses now trying to find a back route to get home without him seeing where I live. At one point I'm running through bushes and mud, no matter what street I end up in, his car is waiting for me. Eventually I ran right in front of his car while it's parked on the side street beside my place and ran into my house through the back entrance. 
the back entrance is obscured by plenty of trees and cars and the surrounding houses are multiple unit homes so I was confident he didn't see what door I got him through. Fast forward to the following Tuesday and I'm walking home. Guess whose car is parked at the halfway mark? This went on for the next four Tuesdays, except he started parking on the street in front of my house, until I begged my manager to take me off closing that specific shift. The last time I saw him, one of the apartment buildings along the way had a few cop cars and cops standing around the entrance and I stayed with them which led him to drive off for the night. A week passes and I'm no longer on that shift. A co-worker of mine sends me a news article via text. I open it and see that the man who's been following me was arrested for doing this to multiple girls in the city along the street my work was on and that I lived on. He got caught because he'd followed a university student up to her house and wouldn't drive away. She called the cops and he was still there by the time they came to arrest him. He got out the next day I believe and was arrested a few more times and was put on restrictions, couldn't be out of his parents' house between certain hours unaccompanied by either parent, before he was deported. I've also heard he didn't actually get deported but I moved away shortly after and didn't keep up with the news on him. I can link the article if anyone wants, I don't live there anymore and wouldn't be giving myself away. So to the creep in the car who used to follow me and multiple other young women home, let's not meet ever again. Hi everyone. I'm really writing this out as a way to vent because I'm in a situation where I feel really stuck. Any advice is appreciated but I'm not sure there's anything that can be said that will actually help. I've tried just about everything. I'm going to start from the beginning. This is a story two years in the making, so I'll try to be as thorough as possible. In 2019, I graduated with my master's degree and moved to a relatively rural area for my PhD, thinking we'd make an investment, my dad and I purchased a house. The intent was to rent it out once I completed my PhD. This house was only a block away from a dive bar where my dad was able to make some pretty good friends. He introduced me to everyone, and everyone let me know that I would be so happy in my new house, because my next door neighbor was the absolute nicest guy you could ever meet. So. We met the neighbor and he did seem nice enough. He suggested we exchange numbers just in case I ever needed anything and I thought that was a good idea. What's the worst that could happen? A few days later, my dad left to go back to his home in another state, and I was left to my own devices. Literally the day he left, it started. My neighbor texted me while I was away and let me know he left a gift for me on my front porch. In this text exchange, he started using pet names like Sweetie and Cutie. I went home and he had left a hand-painted feeding dish for my cats in my mailbox. At this point, I wasn't that alarmed. He was just being nice, I thought. The next day, he sent me more texts with pet names and I took the opportunity to make sure he knew I was not interested in anything romantic. He replied back with a rambling text about how all a person ever needs is friends and he would like to be friends with me. After that, he would send me texts frequently. Everything from inviting me fishing to telling me he left more gifts on my porch. I would often not reply or I would tell him I'm busy. I didn't want to be rude, but I also had no interest in any sort of relationship with him other than neighborly. One night, I got a text from the manager of the bar down the street, letting me know that if my neighbor knocked on my door, I shouldn't answer. She then told me that my neighbor had walked down to the bar with the hatchet and told the bartender he was hearing voices that got louder as he got closer to the bar. He threatened to kill someone with the hatchet if the voices didn't stop. They called the police and the police took the hatchet from him but made no arrest. The manager of the bar picked me up and I spent the night at her house. She told me that the police said my neighbor was on meth. After that, I tried to keep my distance even more. But things got even weirder. One day, I went out to my car to find a dead squirrel in my driveway. This squirrel had very clearly been run over and moved to right in front of my driver's side door. I just stepped over it, got in my car, and left. When I returned home, the squirrel was gone. Shortly after, I received a text from my neighbor that said, someone or something put a dead squirrel in your driveway. Don't worry, I moved it for you. I felt like this was a weird way to word this, and I suspect he's the one who put the squirrel in my driveway. Another time, I walked out of my house to see he had placed an unspent shotgun shell on the bricks in his front yard. He came out and told me that it was to serve as a warning for anyone walking between our houses. For the next couple of months, I did my best to avoid him. He would text me inviting me over and I would come up with an excuse or just ignore him completely. I wanted to remain cordial since he was my neighbor, 
but it was getting very annoying and I was uncomfortable. He would text me as soon as I got home, telling me that he was watching me come and go from my house. Around Halloween, he handcrafted a large casket and wrote, Here lies the last son of a gun who played mind games. November 2012 inch. What the hell? All this time, still sending me texts. Eventually, I got fed up and I stopped responding completely. Less than two weeks after I stopped responding completely, he threw a 50-pound flower pot at my front door. You know those big concrete planters? Yeah, one of those. I called the police who advised me to get a stalking no-contact order. A few days later, I was watching TV when a notification popped up that my neighbor was trying to cast a video to my screen. I declined it. Twice. I filed another report with the police. During this time, I started the process of getting a stalking no-contact order. I saw three different victim advocates who all told me different things. I went out of town for a conference, and during that time, someone had attempted to break into my home. I had an ADT security system, so while they didn't succeed, I was aware of the attempt. After the conference, I came home to the entire world shutting down because of COVID. I was trapped in my home, 24-7, with my stalker neighbor next door. Luckily, court proceedings for protection orders didn't stop. Right before court, he sent me a text telling me he was sorry for what he'd done. That he could tell when he saw me outside that he made me uncomfortable. Then he went on to tell me he can tell my hair has gotten longer and I look beautiful. I went to court and provided all of the evidence I had. The timeline of everything that had ever happened. The texts he'd sent me asking if I wanted a massage. The texts I sent him telling him the way he was speaking to me was inappropriate. The texts saying that he knew he made me uncomfortable. I told the judge that I suspected he had attempted to break into my house while I was out of town. The kicker is... He didn't deny any of it. Actually, he told the judge that he took full accountability for everything. He said he was in recovery and was trying to turn over a new leaf. He didn't oppose the protection order at all. So, in March 2020, I actually received the stalking no contact order. Everything was pretty quiet for a while. I mean, he did some weird crap, but that's because he's a weird guy. It wasn't anything that made me fear for my safety. That is, until he got on drugs again. At this time, we found an unspent shotgun casing in my flower bed. It was consistent with the one he had previously used to send a warning. This occurred a couple months after I started dating my boyfriend, and I suspect it was a warning to him. After this and for a variety of reasons, my boyfriend moved in with me. He moved in pretty quickly, but everything turned out fine. We're still together and as happy in our relationship as we can be. New Year's, 2021, I was awoken to yelling. I turned on my security cameras and got footage of him sticking his head out his window and screaming obscenities at my bedroom window for about seven minutes. It doesn't sound like a long time, but when your stalker is screaming threats and obscenities, seven minutes is a long time. He called me a harlot. He said, happy freaking new year. He said he was going to blow up his house with his gas line. I called the police, who responded. They told me that he never said my name so they can't prove it was a violation of the protection order. The officer said, and I quote, there's nothing illegal about yelling in your own house. They left without even speaking to him. All I could do at this point was do my best to avoid him. I parked on the street because my driveway is pretty close to his front porch. I got used to living with my curtains drawn. I always made sure my cameras were charged, all five of them. Yes, because of him, I spent over $1,000 on cameras. Every inch of my yard is covered. Since then, He's been seen by me and by other neighbors talking to people who aren't there. Going outside and screaming nonsense. Things like, I have Cheerios on my necklace. Or, I'll put my penis in your butt. I'm not even joking. This basically brings me to last week. In the morning, I was getting ready for the day when I heard screaming. Someone is going to die over this sweatshirt. I turned on the cameras. I got footage of him walking around the alley behind my house screaming. Are you freaking proud? How about I get my shotgun? I'll get everybody all fired up. I called the police. Once again, they didn't charge him with violation of the protection order. Instead, they gave him an ordinance violation for disturbing the peace. The police told me that it seems like he's off his medication again. And that was that, they left. Last night, I was awoken by hammering outside my window at 1am. He was cutting down his privacy fence. Horizontally. I called the police for a noise complaint and they just told him to stop. And that was that. As I write this, 
he is outside continuing to horizontally cut down his privacy fence. That means the privacy fence only stands about three feet tall now. This was the one thing that made me feel relatively safe about hanging out in my backyard, and now that's gone. All of this is to say, I'm freaking tired. I just want to live in a house where I can be sure that my neighbor won't try to kill me. Where I can feel confident that he's not going to try to break in. My boyfriend and I are trying to buy a house to move, but it's difficult. I'm a PhD student, so I don't make very much money. Renting won't work, because I have four cats, plus my partner's cat and dog although we have a place secured for them if necessary, and finding a place to rent with so many animals is difficult if not impossible. I refuse to rehome them, so maybe it's partially my fault I'm stuck in this situation. My dad has agreed to co-sign on another mortgage and I've gotten a second job. We should be able to save up enough money within a few months but until then, I'm stuck. I just don't know what else to do. I'm tired. I'm angry. So I figured I'd write this to vent. If you've made it this far, thanks for reading it all. There's still so many different instances that I've left out. I'm just so exhausted. It has taken me many years to tell this story out of both fear and embarrassment. I share this today as more than simply therapy for myself, but as a warning to all people, be careful who you meet on social media. In 2018, my ex-husband and I were at the end of a very tumultuous marriage. He and I had been polyamorous for about three years before I met this guy. His name was Jez. I met Jez on OkCupid. Okay I was 28 and he was 42. We hit it off very quickly. After a few weeks of talking, I agreed to meet up with him at a restaurant close to my house. We sat and talked for a few hours before I invited him over to meet my husband. Things went very well and they seemed to get along so Jez and I started dating. This guy completely swept me off my feet. Jez was sweet and caring. He enthusiastically listened to every little thing on my mind, engaged, and validated me. Over and over again he absolutely revered me for my strength and wisdom. He practically worshipped me for all that I was and all I was becoming. He showered me with gifts, flowers, and random good deeds just to make me feel safe, wanted, and cared for. I had never been in a relationship that felt quite like that. It was wonderful. It was as though we had been looking for each other for years. After the first few weeks, he had a meltdown over my polyamorous nature. He pulled the plug because he said he was already falling for me and couldn't handle sharing me. I stood my ground and accepted this boundary and the fact that I would have to let him go. I left that night sad but confident that I had done the right thing for the both of us. That next week he sent me flowers and a card to my workplace, begging for another chance and reassuring me that he would rather try than not and end up regretting it, even though it was scary, he wanted to take this journey with me. We continued dating and it was just as wonderful. Long nights we spent awake talking, sharing, laughing, love making, and planning. We went places and did things that I had always wanted to do. Then in the deepest, most intimate moments, when we would just sit in silence, he would grip my hand to his face in solidarity and astonishment asking where I've been all this time. Our time together was effortless. We fit together like puzzle pieces. By August of 2018, my marriage had ended, by no fault of Jesus, and by October, my husband had moved out. I was on a lease at the time and knew I couldn't afford the place on my own so finding a roommate was essential. I had no support system to fall back on nor did anyone else I know need a place at the time, so Jez offered to move in. Even then I was hesitant, we had only been together about four months and I knew everything always changes when you move in with a partner. Despite my hesitation, I agreed, he was wonderful to me. How bad could it be? I was not prepared for the change that was to come. It was literally like night and day. Jez suddenly became a different person. He was extremely controlling, jealous, and lazy, nothing like the person I thought I had met. And the way he treated me progressively got worse and worse. Hanging out with friends became a burden, if not impossible because he would blow up my phone, guilting me about leaving him alone or not involving him in some way, yet when I tried to, it was also treated as a burden and inconvenience as he would huff and puff his way through even the concept of leaving space for anyone but ourselves. In December of 2018, we attended my work Christmas party. I had given him the option whether he wanted to go or not. It was really neither here nor there for me, especially because I had already learned that he really didn't do well if he felt pressured into social situations. I opened the invitation to him because he had expressed to me over and over that it was important for him that he was involved in my social life. For the full month he knew about it, 
he insisted that he wasn't going. I took it as him being introverted and didn't push the issue. I let him know that I would make sure he felt welcome if he decided to go, but not to feel obligated. I was surprised when he changed his mind at the last minute and insisted on going, and even more stunned when we went and he actively acted as though he did not want to be there. Everyone there was incredibly welcoming and included him in the festivities and conversation. However, he still practically grumbled the entire night about the whole thing, mumbling insults and critiquing every little part of the party under his breath, as though being there was absolutely awful to have to endure. No one really seemed to notice the low whispering insults and gripes. At one point, after a couple of glasses of wine, my direct manager leaned into Jez and started praising him. She and I were very close, therefore she was intimately familiar with what I had gone through with my ex-husband. I'm so so happy she has you, she belated through wine happy, you have been absolutely transformative for her. It's so nice to see her finally happy and appreciated. Without missing a beat, Jez grimaced at the comment and quickly snapped back, you don't freaking know me. I honestly didn't believe my ears. It was one of those moments where time stops and you just know you couldn't have heard that correctly. I sat brewing on it for a minute before another light-hearted interaction with Jez prompted him to suddenly snap at me through grit teeth. Stop it. This triggered me and I lost it. I pulled him outside and asked him what his problem was. I called out his behavior and told him if he was going to act that way then he could just leave. That if he didn't want to be there, he should have stayed home. He ended up giving a sort of half-assed apology and we went back inside and finished the party. I remember the drive home that night, staring out the dark window at nothing in particular, in worried silence. I might have messed up, was my only thought through the entire drive. This all started out slow, of course. Like, waving me away or invalidating my experiences and ideas due to my age, that I was just dramatizing my experiences because I was young, etc. The man who not six months prior, had validated me, my trauma, and experiences to the ends of the earth. Now every time I started a story or tried to share anything, even trying to plan out meals for the week, he would openly show annoyance as though I was violating his time and attention. Before I knew it, he was snapping at me over every little thing. If I asked how his day was or talked about my day, I would aggressively shut it down. Why do you always ask me that? I don't want to talk shop at home. I really don't care about your work work. Before I knew it, I couldn't even bring him a plate of breakfast without being snapped at. It was as though he was testing me. When Jazz and I first started dating, he flat out refused to talk about most of his exes. He refused to name them or discuss any of the issues or lessons learned. They didn't matter, he would claim. They weren't in his life for a reason. It was the same reasoning he also used in reference to my more recent exes talking about them, including my now ex-husband may as well have become off-limits. Any time I brought up either of our exes, he would become incredibly agitated, belittling, and just overall very aggressive. I took this as both an age gap issue, as I have a tendency to dwell, as well as insecurity and a threat to the life he was trying to build. However, after he moved in and this hot button topic had been established several times, he would bring up his exes and how they looked, telling me on more than one occasion he would have never dated me back in the day, and that I was lucky he lowered his standards. I didn't even really know what to say to this. I would laugh it off and shove it in my back pocket. Noted. He then started bringing up my looks and accusing me of catfishing him. I had stopped taking care of myself due to the isolation and had also put on some weight, so most of my clothes that I had once felt great in no longer fit. And since Jez had also been dishonest with me about his financial position, he was always needing extra money here and there, leaving me broke almost all of the time. A horrible tragedy happened that following summer, while Jez and I were together. I received notice that a good friend I went to art school with shot himself in the head while tripping on LSD. Our whole class was devastated. He was, without contest, the best photographer of our class and one of the most kind-hearted individuals I have ever had the pleasure of knowing. Also as someone who is very familiar with LSD, I was rocked. Jez, however, was far from supportive. He pretty much immediately shrugged it off. That's life. I guess that's what he gets for freaking around with LSD. I was baffled at such an unsympathetic response and even more later when Jez started to interrogate me about my relationship with this guy, asking when the last time it was that I had even talked to this friend. You don't even know this guy anymore. Who cares? I broke up with him the first time after he called me at work raging. I was busy, so I wasn't able to answer right away, but once I was finally able to answer, 
I was met with intense anger. It was storming and one of my dogs was having an anxiety attack due to storm and separation anxiety. This wasn't the first time and he was well aware of what she needed in those moments. Why the freak aren't you answering my calls? You answer when I call you. I don't care where you are. He went on for a few minutes, calling me a crappy girlfriend and laying into me over my sudden distance and lack of communication while I was at work. At this point, I was done and I lost it. I tore into him over everything, especially causing problems for me at work. That being in my life is a privilege and if he's going to wake up every day acting like he hates me, then I don't know what on earth he's even doing with me. I told him that I expected him to get his things and leave, he was always threatening to go back to his old roommates where there was still a room. I didn't want him there when I got home and we could coordinate times for him to come and get the rest. He flat refused, suddenly victimizing himself, claiming he had nowhere to go. How dare you make me fall in love with you? How dare you take me to meet your father and then dump me? My manager and her husband ended up following me home that evening because she was concerned for my safety and had offered to let me stay with her for a few days. I will never forget the scene I walked into. Like Thean Greyjoy begging for his life. My boss stood next to me, watching as this 42-year-old man crawled on his knees before me, begging for mercy and communication. At one point, wrapping his arms around my legs, crying into them, I can't believe this is happening. She's the love of my life, you know that, he cried to my boss. I couldn't believe what I was witnessing. This was the antithesis of the heartless person I had been spending my days with. I shook him off and went to the back of the house, gathering enough of my things to get me through the next few days, as well as any and all valuables I could think of. It took a few days, but after about a week, Jess started blowing up my phone, apology after apology. Suddenly, he was the man I met again, full of humility and self-awareness. He acknowledged the awful way he had treated me and sent me walls and walls of well-thought-out messages, psychoanalyzing his own behavior, where it comes from, and the ways he knows it needs to change. I took him back. Like a dumb, desperate girl, I took him back. It wasn't long into this second round that he started to guilt me over the breakup. My panic had damaged his relationship with the people in my life and he made sure that I knew it was my responsibility to fix it. It wasn't long after this that my car ended up breaking down at a gas station close to home. There was a very nice couple in the vehicle next to me that came to my rescue and checked things out under my hood. The gentleman turned out to be a mechanic for a living so he had a pretty good theory about what could potentially be going on. By this time I had already attempted to contact Jez to let him know what was going on and where I was. It wasn't long till he got off work, so he told me to sit tight and he would be there shortly. Meanwhile, this sweet couple stayed put and kept me company while I waited. Jez barreled in about 15 minutes later, completely ignoring the couple that had helped me. Touching base, the gentleman handed me a slip of paper with the name and phone number on it reviewing what he thought was going on with my car. Before Jez butted in, cutting him off, I said she's fine, he snapped. I could see the woman out of the corner of my eye, slink away at this comment and get into the passenger seat of their car. I could feel the sudden tension, like maybe she's been here before. The gentleman didn't move and shifted his attention to me as Jez walked into the store. I could see he was clearly concerned. Are you okay? He asked in a low, almost whispered, you don't have to answer that but if you need anything, he looked down at the number in my hand and nodded to it, seriously. With that, he got into the driver's seat of his car and drove away. I've thought about that couple countless times since that night. Everything went right back to the way it was before. As though the initial breakup never even happened. The same eggshells, the same belittling. If anything it was worse, because I had permanently damaged our relationship. If I had just not been so dramatic. If I didn't run away from everything, then maybe he wouldn't have to work so hard for respect in my life. One night we got into an argument. I don't even remember what it was about, but I had to be up early for work the next morning, so I paused the argument in order to get some sleep. When I went to lay down, I heard the TV turn on. I have a sound bar, so the volume can get pretty loud. Jez proceeded to turn the volume up and up, and up far past any volume I ever pushed those same speakers to even for parties. The very walls were reverberating with the sound of the TV at astronomical volumes. Jez then started laughing hysterically. It was a laughter manic with anger as though something might be funny on TV but he might also jump through a window right now. I remember laying in bed absolutely horrified at what was happening. I knew things had gotten bad, but now I was scared. I got out of bed and asked him to turn it down, to which he responded, scoffing. 
I'll watch TV if I F asterisk 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 I want to. And turn it up even louder. I felt like I was in a horror movie. I started crying at this point, begging him to please, please just let me sleep. He started mocking me and calling me names for crying. Oh wow. Poor baby is crying again. That's your card isn't it? Crying? This caused the fight to start again and he started screaming at me, followed me to my bedroom, where he suddenly punched a door not two inches from my head. His eyes were black and he looked me in the eye, sending the clear, unsympathetic and hostile message that that was a warning and next time he wouldn't miss. My whole system had shut down at this point and I sank to the floor in a panic attack. My ex-husband had issues with violence. Jez knew that. All our rentals prior to that one had holes in walls and doors peppered throughout our unit due to my ex-husband's inability to handle his emotions. But he never hit me, or even came close to it. I crumpled to the ground feeling powerless, trapped, and afraid. As my thoughts continued to race, he continued to berate and mock my panicked state. Most of our argument from that night was a blur, but ended abruptly once he threatened to put my social security number on the dark web. At this point, all that was left in me was to fight. I blacked out and went ballistic, screaming at him to get out. I felt rabid and dangerous as I screamed like a banshee for him to leave my home. It was over and I was ending it that second. I contacted my landlord and explained what had been going on. Jez would also end up contacting her, weaving his own tale that I was moving out and tried to have the lease transferred into his name. Luckily, since I was several steps ahead of him, my landlord didn't fall for it and contacted me immediately. She personally came and changed my locks for me, gave me the personal contact of a police officer close by in case he showed up again, and took half off my rent for the next month. I'm forever grateful to her for these simple acts of kindness that were above and beyond anything I would ever expect from a landlord. It took weeks for him to stop messaging me. The only reason I didn't block him was out of fear that he would show up at my house. Though I had contacts for protection. I knew I would rather get a daily apology video than have to deal with him on my doorstep. So they persisted. For a while. The same act from before. The love bombing. The promises. Grasping at straws trying to find the weak spot where I would let him back in. But I ignored it. It continued for weeks before he finally gave up. He bowed out gracefully, stating boldly that he will always love me. I left him to read. The illusion was destroyed. It took me several years to pick up the pieces. If my divorce wasn't enough, this definitely made me lose trust in myself. I still don't understand what the end game was. In one of our last discussions, I asked him desperately, what happened to the guy I fell in love with? Jez looked me dead in the eye, smirked, and said, that guy doesn't exist. I told you what I had to tell you in order to get you away from that freaking asshole husband of yours. You're just stupid and fell for it. Jez, let's not meet ever again. Just went on a binge watching stories here and thought I'd share one. This was about 10 years ago. I was working in reality TV and worked late hours. I was driving home from Hollywood which took about an hour and I was running out of gas so I stopped to get some. It was probably 2 a.m. As I was about to get back on the freeway I saw a car quickly pull up and a woman wearing a cocktail dress jumped out looking frazzled and the car sped off. Something didn't seem right. It looked to me like they had gotten into a fight and he just left her on the side of the road. I peered out my window at her and she waved for help. I asked if she was okay and if she needed a ride home and she said, yes, please. She was Hispanic and didn't know English very well, but we had a pleasant conversation as she guided me into the hills of Pasadena, a really nice part of town. I decided that when I dropped her off, I'd give her my band CD which we had just put out called King Devil and I was really proud of. We took an odd route and she lived a lot further than I had anticipated and I had a really weird feeling the whole time. Finally at one point she said, here. I pulled the car over to the driveway and she asked me if I could pull up a little further. So I did, put the car in park and said, well, here we are, but she just sat there looking at me. At that moment it clicked in my head what was exactly going on. I had picked up an escort. A second after I realized it, she grabbed from my crotch and I said, eh no. She said, sex, yes, and made vulgar gestures with her hands and mouth. No. I said, you don't understand, I was just giving you a ride home, I was trying to be a hero, she said, no sex. I need money, I looked in my pocket for a couple bucks but only had twenties, so I said, sorry I don't have money, her demeanor then changed and in a serious, threatening tone said, no. Give me money. 
At this point I looked closer at her and realized that the woman was a lot more masculine than I realized, in fact it may not have been a woman at all. I thought to myself, buckle up Joe, you're about to punch a transvestite hooker in the face, so I put my mean face on, showed her my fists and said, get out of my car. She immediately jumped out like she had been in the scenario before. I was about to drive away but then stopped, rolled down my window and said, wait. I gave her my CD and said, I am King Devil. She looked at the CD, put her arms out towards me through my window while making a kissing face. I stepped on the accelerator and she ran along the car with her arms still extended out for half a block till I just peeled out. I'm a 29-year-old female and I grew up in a nice suburban neighborhood. I lived in the same house my entire childhood and only left once I moved out as an adult. I always felt safe, leaving our doors unlocked, windows open going for late night walks as a teen. I was around 17 when I noticed strange things started happening around my house. My house was also haunted, so weird noises and things moving on their own were not a new thing. This is probably why I, and my family, dismissed my experiences for too long. As a teen, I worked at a movie theater and I did not work until the afternoon and would get off very late at night. I turned into quite the night owl, and it was normal for me to stay awake until about 3 in the morning. It started off as my dog reacting to things outside. I would peek outside my window and I would never see anything so I assumed my dog was just hearing noises and overreacting. Not too long after this started, I was outside and noticed there were handprints and a mark between them on my window, as if somebody was pressing their forehead against the glass. At the time I just dismissed it. I had plenty of friends coming in and out of my house and they would knock on my window sometimes as they arrived my window was by the driveway as you walk to the front door. The weird thing is that this window is very large. The window would start about three feet from the ground and go at least eight feet high and was about four feet wide, one story house. The forehead and hand marks were at least six feet five inches feet high from the ground. I definitely did not have any friends who were that tall and everyone in my family is less than five feet six inches. Soon after that, I woke up around five in the morning to my car alarm going off. Again, I did not think anything of it and dismissed the situation. This happened a few more times within the next few weeks, always between 4 to 5 in the morning, but the last time I noticed handprints on the top of my car as if somebody was trying to crawl through my open sunroof. After that, I made sure to close all my windows and lock the doors. Again, I dismissed it thinking just some hoodlums were trying to get into unlocked open cars. Not long after the car incident, things started to escalate. One morning as I was leaving for school I found a small step ladder outside of my window, leaning against the house, as if somebody was looking through my window. I had blinds that would move from the top and bottom. I normally had the blinds closed on the bottom and left about two feet open on top to allow sunlight in, but still have privacy. When I looked out my window, I could still see the handprints and forehead marks placed right above the opening of my blinds. This means they were able to use a step ladder to get a good look into my room. With the ladder against my window, I started to piece together the events over the last few months and realized I had a peeping Tom. I brought this up to my parents, but they did not seem to worry and made no effort to do anything about it. Over the next year I found the ladder against my window many more times. This person would use an old step ladder that we had in the side yard that was unlocked. I would continuously put the step ladder back in the side yard, but it would continue to show up next to my window on many mornings. I don't know why I did not just put the step ladder in a place that was not accessible. To be honest, I was a teen smoking a lot of weed at this time, so I feel as though I was not using very much critical thinking. I have two other sisters who lived with us, but they did not seem to notice anything weird happening. About a year after I noticed the occurrences, we found my sister's bra was out in the yard and we did not have any explanation. This made me think that somebody may be trying to actually get in the house when we were gone, with success. I became extremely paranoid. We would often hear male voices outside our front doors, but it was common for us to hear disembodied voices due to the house haunting. My sisters and I were often home alone, and when unexplained voices happened, we would just go to our room, turn on some SpongeBob and try your best to ignore it. Again, my parents were aware that all of this was happening, but did not care to do anything about it. The last incident before we called the police was after a rainy night we found bare footprints outside of my sister's window in the mud. The screen had been fiddled with as if somebody was trying to get it off of the window. Once this happened, 
my parents started to take it more seriously. It's funny because they did not care when incidents were happening directly to me but the moment my sister had this experience, they decided to report it. The police could not do anything about it. They offered to send the police every once in a while to fill out their paperwork in front of our house to make it seem like there was a police presence. This only happened one time and they never came back. My older sister made her boyfriend aware of the situation so they decided to sit in the car all night and watch for the pervert to show up. Every time he would try to pull an all-nighter to watch for this person, no one would show up. Looking back now, it makes me think that someone very close to my house must be the peeping Tom because he must have been close enough to see we had another person watching out for us. After a few years of these experiences, my sisters and I all moved out and we have not noticed anything weird happen since. It still bothers me knowing that this person was never caught and that we still have no idea who it was. It makes me frustrated knowing that it could be a next door neighbor who we thought was normal, but was actually a pervert. This all was happening around 2010 to 2013 and was before we had easy affordable access to security cameras, such as Ring and Blink. I wish we had cameras so we could know who this person was, but there is no point in dwelling over the past. All I know is now that I am an adult, I will always have security cameras around my house, especially if I have young daughters. I have also bought my parents some security cameras because they still live in the house. Maybe one day those cameras will catch the peeping Tom, but I don't think he will come back now that my sisters and I are all moved out.